Hello and welcome to an exclusive hour-long programme with me, Alex Belfield, talking to one of my favourite people ever. How are you, Colin Nolan? I'm fine, thank you. How very kind of you to say that. Let me tell you about you. You're delicious, you're talented, and you're here with me for the hour. I couldn't be happier. Well, I'm glad I paid you that money to say that. The last time we spoke, we were just across the street at another radio station that fired me, shortly after speaking to you. I said to you at the time, we go back a long way. You don't know it, but I do. Uh, Really? How far back are we talking? Well, I'm talking about when I was a teenager. There you were on my wall. That far back? Mm. Wow. (laughs) The thing is, you've got it, haven't you? You're just sexy and everybody loves you. And more so since the last time we spoke, you seem to have had this comeback where everybody wants to talk to Colleen Nolan. Are you glad to be here? I can't get over that I'm here. I'm still in shock about it all because the last two years have been just mad. Um, And, you know, if someone had have told me a few years ago, you know, when you get in your 40s, actually you'll have the best career of your life, I would have laughed and not believed them. But it's happening and I'm frightened I'm going to wake up. Do you think it was Loose Women that made you be here today in a sense that we got to see the true you, we got to see how honest you are and real you are and at times raw? Um, Yeah, definitely Loose Women have played a a massive part in my career, obviously. And... um, And on a business front, a change of managers (laughs) helped greatly as well. It must be difficult being a star in show business because you're only as good as the people who are representing you and the advice you're given. You must be offered stuff that you don't even know about and therefore the people who are turning it down are actually determining your success. Yeah, um, I think that's what was happening um, before. And also you meet a lot of people who promise you the earth and then sit in their office and wait for the phone to ring. And of course it doesn't ring. You you have to phone people. And I'm very lucky that a couple of years ago I met a chap that... um, to be honest, has turned my life around. It's odd, isn't it? Because most people, especially women in their 40s, are finished. Well, that's the thing, and especially in the industry I'm in, and actually, yeah, women in general, you know, they are kind of told that when you get in your 40s, you're washed up and forget it and you're not sexy and you can't do this and you're not good-looking enough. Um, And what's been really nice about my career kind of taking off in my 40s, I've met so many women that have said, you know, you gave me the incentive to to not give up and to get out there and do it and that was that's brilliant we've got to talk about loose women and we'll talk about it more at the end but what that show does basically is give women a voice and you say the things that everybody else is thinking i watch that program sometimes and cringe at how honest you all are both about your private life and stuff is there a line because you seem to be incredibly open well my problem is um and maybe this is why they keep employing me is that there isn't a line i just there should be but I've got a big gob, basically, that I can't keep closed. And if somebody asks me a question, I'll answer it honestly. And when you're doing that programme, you do actually forget that it's going out, you know, to millions of people and I'll get home and no-one's talking to me or I get offset and I've got 35 missed calls and I think, oh, no, what have I said? I forgot it was live. So, um, But I think that's the um, appeal of the show. You know, you can't edit yourself on a show like that, I don't think. And then, of course, you bring out a book, which means you have to reveal everything, Mm -hmm. because these days we need salacious gossip. And we'll talk about the specifics of the book, but you've been all over the papers recently. At this point, are you glad that you revealed the things you revealed? Because, again, it's brought you into the papers, and, of course, they've picked out the worst bits. Yeah, it's quite scary anyway, writing your autobiography. And initially, when I was first writing it, I thought, oh, I don't know whether to put that bit in. But, you know, I just said to myself, I've always said if I wrote my autobiography, I wanted it to be honest, really honest. And you can't leave out the bad bits that are going to make you look bad or the mistakes that you've made because you're frightened people won't like you. You know, I have made mistakes in my life. Um, I've learnt from them, hopefully, and never made them twice. Um, but I've, I just wanted it to be honest. But again, when you're writing it, you don't think about it then being in print and seeing it on the shelves and people in the street coming up and go, oh, I didn't know you did that when you were younger and you think, oh, everyone knows. But, you know, I don't know. I, I've probably said most of it on Loose Women anyway, so... And again, your life has been an open book because we've known you for so long and that's what's nice about you. People feel they genuinely know you. Look, we've wasted five minutes already and I'm going to ask you a proper question. So we'll take a piece of music and we'll come back next with one of my favourite people, Colleen Nolan. We're back on your favourite local radio station. It's Alex Belfield talking to the gorgeous Colleen Nolan, who's looking thinner and more gorgeous than ever. For those who want to know, how have you done it? Um, Just from years of yo-yo dieting and, you know, losing two or three stone on each diet I go on, but they're silly diets and putting it back on, I just got my head round it and went sensible, 
you know, I knew what was making me fat. I knew I didn't have to crash diet. I just needed to cut out the crisps and chocolate and stay away from the fridge mm. and exercise. Right. I have a thing called man boobs. I don't know if you've heard of them. Yeah. How do I get rid of mine? Um, well, I, I'm not quite sure. Have you tried the gym <laughs> a little bit? I'm too um, busy talking to people like you. I haven't time for a gym. I, I find them strangely attractive, <laughs> I have to say. I think you should keep them. I think I'm pushing a B cup at the moment. Yes, I, don't... I think you are. <laughs> don't go any higher because they charge a £2 extra the higher you go in marks. <laughs> right, let's go back to the beginning and find out about you as a child because, of course, reading this book, you realise that you were like the Von Trapps. I mean, you were known as the Von Trapps okay. of Blackpool. You were in the clubs at a young age and that's not really a place for a kid, is it? No, not really. But, you know, in those days... You know, you wouldn't get away with it nowadays, but in those days you did, and we were a working family and we had to work. You know, my mum and dad were quite poor and had eight kids and we lived in a little terrace house, and, and that's how we survived. And we didn't know, I certainly didn't know any different. I was born into it, as they say. But having now had children of my own, I can't imagine taking them to a, a working men's club in the middle of wherever and doing four, you know, 45-minute spots every night and then getting up for school. It's bizarre to me, but that was how it was in those days. You said something interesting there. You said we had to do it to survive. Didn't they have to do it to survive? Yes, I suppose, you know, it was down to them. They were singers anyway, and in actual fact, what happened initially was my mum was heavily pregnant, I think with her fourth child, which would have been Maureen, and so she couldn't go with my dad. And the three eldest did actually, because they were quite older then, they, they did actually say, can we please have a go? They were desperate. And that's how it started. And as each one came along, they just wanted... And I suppose by the time I came along, they just assumed she'll want to. <laughs> It'd be fine. Did you enjoy it? I had some really great times, really great family times. You know, the one good thing was we were always together as a family and we were really close. I mean, we had terrible rows and stuff, but considering we were together 24-7, um, I had a, you know, the majority of the time I had a great time, but looking back, some of it I hated. I wanted to be a kid, and I feel that I never was, really. All I know about clubs, and I've done quite a few of them in my time, is they're grotty and they're dirty, and your dressing room's smaller than the studio we're sat in now. There's nothing fun about it other than the two minutes you get to sing, mm. and the possibility is somebody's going to throw a cabbage at you. Mm. It's not a glamorous world, is it? It's definitely not a glamorous world, and they always said, you know, when you get into business, if you want to go into show business, you should do a circuit of the clubs first. Um, because you really, it's tough, you know. And like you say, the dressing room, you can imagine with 10 of us in them, they were tiny. Um, but, you know, having said that, we, we probably, some of our best audiences, you know, they used to go absolutely mental, as you would see in a mum and dad and eight kids, the youngest being two on stage. <laughs> um, so, yeah, there was, there was a lot of, I didn't like about it, and there was, we had good times as well. Were you ever booed off or were you ever paid off? No, actually. Were you? Many times. <laughs> I hate to bring that up. But, I, you know, I think they'd be really harsh to boo kids off the stage. <laughs> and um, unlike yourself, we were good. <laughs> <laughs> You're right. No, no, you are right. I love the stories like Dusty Springfield one day was going on in a club in the north and the guy said, I've heard that there's people using the car park as a toilet. Now, we're not having no more of that. Here's Dusty Springfield. <laughs> no, that's exactly it. Or halfway through. The things that did happen was like halfway through a medley would be doing. The Tano would come on, you know. <laughs> Bingo, in the next room we'll start in five minutes, just as you're halfway through a ballad, you know, and you think, hello. Well, the two things I learnt about it is, A, never, ever get in the way of the bingo or the buffet. No, never. I mean, you have to finish on time for the bingo, or th otherwise they will lynch you. Yeah, absolutely. The rugby nights where I've also wondered, would they be better putting my feet into the bingo money? Because actually they don't care. A CD would have sufficed. <laughs> yeah. They, actually, the bingo winner's probably earning more than what you're getting. Yeah. Yeah, there is all of that. All right, we'll come back next with Colin Nolan and talk about Daddy and all the stuff that's been in the papers. We'll get that to one side, and then we'll talk about why you're fabulous. <laughs> oh, I'm speechless at that one. We're back with Colin Nolan here on your favourite local radio station. The dad stuff, let's put this to one side because there's been a lot in the papers about it. Have they gone too far? Have they said things about him that actually aren't true? I think it's a very kind of small part of the book. And, you know, when I was very, very much younger, um, my dad was a heavy drinker when we were doing the clubs. And unfortunately, in drink, he wasn't nice. Um, but what they've done is they've totally... They've taken one tiny bit of the book and blown it out of proportion and made it sound like he came home every single day and beat the hell out of us, which isn't true. Um, 
there was one time in the book that was specific because at the time it was the only time really where he really smacked me where I it was unfair and I I suppose as a kid I was only about four or five but that's always stayed with me that one moment um, because it was a cruel time and um, you know like I said he wasn't a nice drunk but then he gave up drink I mean the last 20 years of his life he didn't drink and he was fantastic when he was sober and even in the earlier days when he was sober um, he was a great dad you know he had his problems and I think he made mistakes but I, I loved him I still love him um, so it's hard because I think some of his sisters in Ireland now aren't talking to me because of the book because they never saw that side of him and they just idolised him and so now it's like you're lying he never did he never hit your mum and I wanted to go well you weren't in the house you know and when he was drunk he did he slapped her um, so there were those times but a lot of things went on in those days that you just in those days you didn't talk about anything you know what's what went on in your house stayed in your house I'm sure it was happening you know in every second house on the street at the time but you just didn't discuss it Do you think stuff had happened to him previously that created that monster at his worst times? Um, I don't know because I never met my dad's dad, my granddad. Um, he died before I was born. And my dad's, my nana came to live with us when I was younger and she was a scary woman. So whether he was brought up, I don't know, with it, whether she was like the rod of iron that made him the way he was, I don't know. But then his sisters are so lovely and gentle and very kind and, and my da- as my dad could be. And has it made you scared of alcohol at this point? How are you feeling about what that does to people? It hasn't made me scared of it. I just can't bear it. I mean, I am known as the drink police on Loose Women when we go out. And it's not that I'm against it. You know, I don't mind the odd drink and I don't mind people being tipsy. And, you know, it's it's that next stage where they totally just lose themselves. And even if they're nice, happy drunks, when they get to the point where they cannot have a conversation, where you know they're not going to remember any of it in the morning, I have to walk away because I can't bear what it does to people. And that stems from childhood. And again, it must have changed you as a parent, not wanting to put that fear into your kids, whether that be through alcohol, shouting or anything. Yeah, well, definitely the shouting. I'm, I, that's another thing I can't... I'll sit and discuss anything for hours, but as soon as you shout at me, I have to walk away because I can't bear it. I turn into a five-year-old. Um, and I, I kind of, you know, with my kids, I discuss everything with my kids. And that, again, stems from childhood because there was things that you just couldn't talk about with my mum and dad or kids didn't then. Um, and there was times when I wanted to as a kid and didn't feel I could. So when I had kids of my own, yeah, all of this I kind of learnt from my experiences. So, you know, my boys now are at an age where they drink. But I've kind of taught them that's fine but keep having water as well, you know, don't mix and don't keep drinking and just, you know, remember what you're doing because it's dangerous. What pressure do you think is on them, you being mummy and you being Colleen Nolan, because I'm sure the papers are waiting to get a story on them to bring you into it. Does that worry you? It worries me for them because it is a pressure on them. They're young boys, you know, and and you do have to keep reminding them, look... They will be waiting for you, you know, to get a girl pregnant, God forbid, or, you know, whatever. It will be Colin Nolan's son or Shane Ritchie's son, you know. So that is a bit of a pressure that I think is unfair on them because they don't, they didn't ask for that. But again, that's the environment they've been brought into, so they accept it. And finally, about the dad thing, do you wish you'd have left it out of the book at this point? Has it been too hurtful? Are you glad for the people who have gone through it as well? Because, of course, people will read that and go, that happened to me, and it may have given them strength. Um, Yeah, I've had some really good response about that section already of people that it has happened to, um, people that felt like they still hadn't come out of it and it had kind of given them incentive to do something, but you know, put it to bed. I couldn't leave it out. It's part of my life, and what... But what I wanted to get into it as well was as well as the dark stuff, you know, there was so much fun and so much great times with my dad. He was great. So, um, yeah, and I couldn't leave it out. It's an autobiography. It's my life. You can't leave it out. That's lying. And during that time, did it bring you closer to your mother and your sisters and created something more special? I, you know, my mum was fabulous. I mean, she kept us all together. But there was times when I was younger where I, I kind of went through times of not having a lot of respect for her because I kept thinking, why would you let anybody do that? And, you know, I said to her, why, why don't you walk away? But she had eight kids and no money. And in those days, you didn't walk. If you walked away, you were the bad person. Whatever your reasons were, you broke up the, the home. So she didn't really have a choice. And then when my dad died, 
you know, the only person he wanted in the room holding his hand was my mum. And it really choked me because I thought that's why they stayed together because underneath it all they loved each other. And the sad thing is your instinct is to say, well, that was of its time, that was of their generation. The figures show that that isn't the case and it's mm. still going on today and the women still don't walk away. The difference is with my mum. My mum was not scared of my dad. She was a feisty woman. I mean, you know, there was times I used to go, just shut up arguing with him because you know he's going to give you... But she wouldn't. She absolutely wouldn't. And the way she stopped it, you know, she did say to him one day after years, you know... Because my mum drank tea with no milk and she said... uh, Right, Tommy, she said, if you slap me again, you're getting this tea over your head. And he did, and she did, and he never slapped her again. It's that bullying thing. Because he then realised, actually, she really isn't scared of me. So my mum wasn't scared. My mum didn't want to leave him. She loved him. She gave as good as she got. She never got physical with him, but she, um, you know, she'd stand up to him. I think a lot of women nowadays, the fear... I mean, there's, you know, there's the odd slap and there's serious abuse, and I can't imagine the fear of that. So I think a lot of it is fear and threats that make them stay. All right, coming up next, we're going to do Loose Women, Dancing on Ice, Shane Ritchie. We've got a lot to get to next with Colleen Nolan. We're back with Colleen Nolan on your favourite local radio station. It's Alex Belfield talking to one of the most popular TV stars at the moment, and that really started with the Nolans, but it's interesting how you've stuck out since. Let's go back to the beginning of that then. Did you stick out in those days? No, not really. Well, probably I did because I was the youngest Nolan, and there was a big hoo-ha when I joined baby Nolan and all of that and I was only 15 when I joined them so I got a lot of press then but as a group no I was just ooh ooh ooing in the background (laughs) when you see those videos now and you did a lot of that less singing more ooing when you view it is it like somebody else in a different time and a different person in some ways yes but I still look back I probably appreciate it more now when I when I see it back than I did at the time because at the time it was just incredible hard work it was relentless now I look back and go Oh, it was great, though. And look how young I look. And, you know, I didn't have any worries and didn't know what was ahead of me. Um, so, yeah, it was it was a good time. But, it, yeah, it is a bit like looking at my daughter. And, again, you weren't big stars over here like you were in Japan. You weren't bad over here. But there it was like Beatlemania. Why did that happen, do you think? I think in Japan they're really, really family-orientated and they haven't got really any Japanese kind of all-singing, all-dancing families. So I think that was a major um, a, a major point for us that they just couldn't get over, that we were all from one family. I was only 15. Our fan base over there was probably 12 to 16, whereas over here it was kind of like 8 to 80, you know, it was right across the board. But, yeah, they went absolute. I mean, we were number one over there in all the charts, international and domestic charts, before we even got there. So it was mania when we got over there. It was fabulous. But, again, I didn't appreciate it at the time. I did a little bit, but I spent most of it going, oh, I just want to go home. I'm so tired. Why didn't you get involved in the drink and the drugs and all the things that the 15-year-olds today get involved with when they get fame? What has changed that if you want to be a star today as a kid, you have to go off the rails? I think I was in a family group, so, and I was youngest with sisters, who, some of whom were a lot older than me. <laughs> They'll be pleased to hear me say. So I think they, you know, your family always keep your feet on the ground. You know, our dad was our manager, our brothers were with us, um... So we never went off the... I mean, we did a bit, you know, God, we did drink. I will say that at that point, um, you know, after the show every night and us and the band had just go wild. But I know we never got into drugs or... I didn't even know what drugs were till much later on. Um, But I don't know why it is now. I think because fame seems to come massively very quickly now. You know, for me, what I was doing at that age, I'd been doing since I was two. Yes, it grew onto a bigger scale, but it was something I didn't know any different in life. You know, people go, what was it like becoming a pop star? I don't know, because I never had that moment of singing in front of a mirror with a hairbrush going, one day I want to be a pop star. It's just something that fell into place. So I think from going for a normal kid to all of a sudden worldwide, you know, adulation must be a lot to take off, especially if you're not surrounded by family. And then you turn 15 and suddenly boys are interested in Colleen Nolan. I know there's been talk in the papers and again in the book, obviously, um, about your first pregnancy. How did that happen and why did it happen? My first pregnancy it was my very first love of my life. Um, and he was the keyboard player in the band. And just, I don't know why it happened. You know, I was 
just turned 16 thinking I knew it all and obviously didn't and was too shy and embarrassed certainly to talk about contraception and and in that mode of, well, it, it's my first time, it won't happen to me, all of those things, and it did. Um, and unfortunately, it was at a time when, you know, we were just on to our second or third big hit. And we had that reputation of, you know, the Waltons, and I thought, I'm going to ruin all of their careers. I've only just joined, and I'm going to ruin their career, and I'm going to devastate my mum and dad. And it, I just thought, I can't tell anybody. I have to sort this out myself. It's my mistake. I have to sort it out myself. And luckily, he was great as well, Robin, and he helped me. And we did, and people say now, you know, oh, I, you know do you regret it? I regret it happened, but I don't re regret the decision I made at that time. It was the only decision, as far as I was concerned, that I could make. However, I've never made the same mistake twice. What is interesting when you watch Loose Women and you see the debates about teen pregnancies, mm. I notice you have sympathy with them because mm. you can understand how that can happen. Mm. We talk much more openly now about everything. Nothing seems to be as embarrassing. You know, there's adverts for condoms and there's, there's you know, adverts on telly about catching diseases and all of that. But ultimately, a 15, 14, 15-year-old 15 girl still has that shyness, still has that, oh, I don't want to look like I don't know what I'm doing... You know, that doesn't change. You can throw all the adverts in the world at them, but the actual mentality of a 14 and 15-year-old is the same now as it was when I was 14 or 15. Um, so I think that's the problem, and I understand how they can make mistakes. Did you confide in any of your sisters, or was it just between you and him? No, it was just between me and him. I didn't confide in anyone because, you know, I knew if I confided in one of the sisters, they would feel... I need to tell someone because if something happens, they're going to blame me and I didn't want to put that pressure on them. Or And I was scared that they would tell someone. And how old were you when you finally revealed it? Um, what date was the book out? <laughs> um, for some of them, it'll be the first time in the book. Uh, but no, it was only only a few years ago after I'd had you know my kids and marriage and all of that. Yeah, no, I didn't. It was a many, many years I kept it a secret, and I never, ever told my mum and dad. And I never would have put it in the book if my mum and dad had still been alive. There's just some things you don't want your parents to know. Is that why you've waited till now? Selfishly, yes. I would never have... I wouldn't have even contemplated writing a book while my mum and dad were alive because there will be things in there. And I don't even mean things... I mean, the termination, yeah, would have killed them. And I don't think I'd have spoken about my dad as, as in-depth as I did if he'd have been alive because it would hurt my mum as well. Um, in fact, I wouldn't have written the book. But even stuff that's happened, you know, with my marriage to Shane, it just would have upset them and I just thought I've, I would just couldn't have done that to them. Coming up next, we'll talk about Shane with Colleen Nolan. We're back on your favourite local radio station. It's Alex Belfield talking to the gorgeous Colleen Nolan. And next we move on to one of the most famous marriages ever and then one of the most famous divorces ever. You kept a very dignified silence up till recently in Loose Women about Shane Ritchie. I think it was nice eventually for us to hear your side because he seemed to say a lot and you didn't say much at all. Initially, no, I didn't say anything at all because of the boys. And, you know, they have to go to school and get the mickey taken out of them by mates or whatever. And it's not nice to hear your parents slagging each other on the telly. However, they are now 20 and nearly 17. So I'm not quite as protective as I was because they can handle it. And they know everything. And everything that's in the book, the boys know, I've told them, that so that it wouldn't be shocking for them. I didn't want them to read it and be shocked. Um, and I still think even in the book I've been pretty kind... I haven't, you know, I've I've stated the facts, but it's not a, you know, and Shane's this and Shane's that because ultimately they are his children, and there's nothing worse than hearing your parents slag each other. But yeah, I've interviewed Shane a couple of times, and the one thing I know about him is he's exceedingly talented. I saw him in Greece probably I don't know 15 years ago, and he just stole the stage as he always does. He's incredibly loud and funny and charismatic, and I can see why you fell for him. That presumably wasn't difficult. No, absolutely not. He is Alfie Moon, actually. When he got the part in EastEnders, I thought, <laughs> I married Alfie Moon. I mean, that is exactly him. He's a lovable rogue. He would get away with murder. Like you say, incredibly talented. Charmer. Charm personified, that man. But there is that other side as well, that there's a massive ego that needs feeding constantly. Um, and actually, probably a lot of insecurity underneath that bravado. So, you know, when you're married to someone and you see them 24-7, you see all the other aspects of them. 
there's going to be an ego in all of us or we wouldn't be sat here wearing headphones. Mm. At what point did it become too much with Shane? And what was the moment you thought, I don't think I can take any more of this Shane Ritchie? Well, when we were together, what was good was is that I always kind of brought him back down to earth, you know, because obviously, you know, he's getting a lot of work, a lot of adulation, and he did he, the adverts he was doing at the time took off. And so, you know, when he'd come home and try and be... I'm Shane Ritchie at home. He just didn't get away with it with me. But he liked that because it was like, oh, yeah, I forgot where I was for a minute. The point where it became too much was the point where I found out he was having an affair. And that destroyed it, really, because I, I, when I first found out, I thought, OK, this happens a lot. I'm not willing to throw our life together and bring our kids from a broken home for one mistake. And I was willing to kind of forgive... Um, and we'd get counselling and all of that. And I would have forgiven him when I found out. But the problem was then I found out that it never ended. And that's when I just thought, I can't stay. I don't know whether somebody said this to you before, but I wasn't surprised when I read that story, mm. not because of him, but because of his lifestyle. Mm. Theatre is a very intense place where you become very lonely and you've got naked people around you who are getting changed and suddenly you're in the pub after the show. It's a difficult environment and lifestyle to be dedicated to one person, isn't it? Absolutely, and especially if you're the type of person that Shane is. Um, and at that point, not only in a theatre, it wasn't even that he was feeling lonely, you get them throwing themselves at you. You know, they did it when I was there. You know, I'd be at the stage door with him and girls would come up and put room keys in his hand next to me and and, and say, I'm at this hotel, meet me later, you know. And, yeah, absolutely, I understand. I understood all of that because I'm in the same business and I could kind of cope with all of that and we used to laugh about it. What I couldn't cope with was the one girl and the one affair that had gone on a long time, which was the out-and-out out lies, hurtful lies. Because I used to say to him, you know, we've been together a long time, please like me enough to at least tell me what's going on because I'm going insane. I really thought I was going insane. And he used to swear in his life and say, no, there isn't, and it's you, you're mad, basically. Because he didn't want it to end. He didn't want me to leave. He was desperately scared of losing me, but he didn't want to give up his other life as well. How do you then trust again and 100% believe that that won't happen again? Um, I always said, you know, with every relationship I've been in, I hate women that become bitter and twisted and go, all men are the same, because I don't believe they are. Um, and I, I trust people until they let me down, and then I can't... They can never regain that trust, that's it for me. Do I trust anyone 100%? No. I trust my husband 95%, but I give him the 5% of human error that we've all got. And especially with men, I think it's hard for them to be monogamous. I can understand why on a cold, lonely, dark night somewhere, maybe in Swindon, where you're a bit bored, it would be easy to think, well, I will go to room 427, because what else is there to do? It, it, show business it kind of runs by different rules, it doesn't does, it? It does run by... Well, there's a lot more temptation in showbiz on a daily basis, but at the same time, then, don't get married and have kids. You can't have it all. Unless you are with someone who, from the beginning, that is your arrangement. And I met a lot of women who got in touch with me in show business when they found out about China and said, don't worry about it, my husband's done it for years, as long as he brings me a diamond home, or as long as I still get to keep, you know, go to the villa in Marbella. And I thought, well, that's fine for you, and I'm happy that that works, but it doesn't work for me. Not the one-night stands, the affair. I could cope with the one-night stand. It's just the affair. Talking of which, I'm staying in the Premier Lodge, room 13, if you're Are interested. Are you? Well, I did inquire. We're back with Colleen Nolan with our remaining moments. I've got to get to a lot of stuff, so come on, let, let's get to it. Stop <laughs> distracting me with all your exciting life. <laughs> Is that sarcastic, then? Loose women, let's talk about that. I love that Jane MacDonald. How's she doing? Oh, she's great. Jane is fabulous. But I thought it was me you loved. Well, I do. No, I love now you. Now we're at the end. You're revealing your true feelings. There are different types of love, remember? Oh, there is, yes. On different days, <laughs> yes. Do you enjoy it? I mean, you go on there and you talk nonsense for an hour, five times a week, and it's just a fun show that seems to have taken off. I look at your calibre of guest and think, Bette Midler's willing to come on there. Dame Edna's willing to come on there. You're up there with Parky. How is that possible at 12.30 on a weekday? Do you know what? We are so stunned ourselves, and especially in the last year to 18 months. We had Whoopi Goldberg on last week, which was just incredible. We're, we're just amazed as everyone else. I think the show has just found its niche and it's found, you know, people at home who can relate to one of us on the panel. We talk about everyday life, everyday problems. 
Um, you've got Carol, who's, you know, politics mad and wants to just... I don't know what she wants to do with all the politicians, but it's not nice. <laughs> and then you've got me who hasn't got a clue about politics, but that's the same as people at home. Yeah, it, I think it just works, and we get a lot more men now actually going, mm, don't tell anyone, but I actually watch you every day. You know, it's a good, fun show to watch. It's for women. For men, it's like being able to come to a girls' night out that, and find out what we actually do talk about, which 90% of the time is slagging you lot. It is interesting, and I do learn a lot, and I learn how to get round you to make you think that I'm smarter than I really am. Yes, yes, we do give away a bit too many <laughs> tips for you men, yes. Now, you're sat there on that side of the desk, and I'm this side. Would you rather that be reversed? Because, of course, you're the interviewer on the programme. I know you talk a lot about yourself, mm. well, because you're very important, but would you rather be asking the questions than answering them? Um, I like both aspects of it. I'm probably more comfortable being interviewed than actually interviewing. It depends who the guest is, as you know. You can get some guests that it's like pulling teeth and they go yes and no and that's as much as you're going to get out of them. Um, not like me, who never shuts up, really. <laughs> but, um, yeah, and also I, I'm... The problem with me is is that halfway through some of the interviews I get bored because <laughs> I think I'm not bothered, actually, about you. There's four of us there. I mean, it's hard for the guests because there's four of us and we get six minutes with each guest. They don't get a long time on our show, unfortunately. So it's hard to get all of that out of them. But the ones that come on and just go absolutely mental and talk about everything and possibly at the end remember that they're on to promote the book, <laughs> which they're getting in the last five minutes. They're always the better guests. Mm. And it is scary. I mean, it's scary to do any interview, but to come onto that show and sit in the middle of us four, I mean, men visibly shake when they come, seriously shake. They all come on going, oh, I'm really scared. It, it's weird, so it is quite hard for them. But, yeah, if, you haven't, if they haven't really had a life, it's, it's tough six minutes. And your dream panel of four is... I do actually love all of them. I think the ones that work really gel, we know each other inside out, are Jackie, me, Carol and Jane. I love Jackie and I love Andrew, they're great. But I loved Kay Adams when she did it. I think she's a master at that job. Jackie's going, from what I understand. Is there any chance Kay will come back or has she moved on? I'm on a kind of campaign to bring back Kay because I, I love her and I do think she's a master at what she does. She can cover every spectrum. You know, we could have the Prime Minister on and Kay could take him on whereas the rest of us, I'm not sure we could. Or she could have a comic on and be equally as funny. She's just a clever woman. She kind of made it a bit more sensible. I think you've gone more silly, and I don't know whether that's worked for ratings more. I, I totally agree with you, but I think on some days we've gone too silly. And I think what's, what, what sometimes can be... For me, I just we are middle-aged women, and sometimes it's not funny to see four middle-aged women prattling on. You know what I mean? I I don't want us to go too silly. I think I always used to like when Kay was there, we'd have a serious topic and then be silly. And that was a good balance. But some days at the moment, everything's silly. And I think, oh, you know, I do feel a bit... You've kind of got to be entertaining and you've got to fulfil the ambition of the show, which is to be still popular and award-winning. And that's yeah. tough day in, day out. Mm, it is. And the corpsing thing normally is something that's not funny because... It's not even something we said. We're just tired on certain days. And um, I, sometimes I just look at Jane or she looks at me and we laugh. And she's very professional and can hold it together. I can't. Once I go, I go. So I might get the camera off me because I can't get it back. I just can't. I'm rubbish. Thank God for Sky Plus because when you get boring, I can fast forward and then find a good bit. <laughs> yeah, that's what I do. <laughs> and I just stop at your bits. Because the thing about you is you're talented, you're gorgeous. This is like my first opening, isn't it? <laughs> it is. I've mentioned your bits quite often. You have. You you have a thing about my bits. I'm we had no chance to talk about Dancing on Ice. And there we got to see you in all your splendour, in yep. leotards mm -hmm. and tight things. Mm -hmm. We did. We got to see my dinner on some occasions, <laughs> actually. Um, yes, that was very challenging, very scary. And um, I'm still quite traumatised. Physically, I'm fine. My ribs have gone back into place. But um, mentally, I still have nightmares. And I wake up and think, oh, it's, I don't have to do it. It's finished. <laughs> it was hard, really hard. Where do you go from here? You've got the book out. You've got the successful <laughs> TV show. What would you like to do next? Is there any direction you intend on going in? Or do you just let the business decide that for you? You know what? I've never had a direction. I've just always see what happens the next day. So I'm just going to keep that because I think the day I start going, right, I want this and I want that is the day it'll end. So I'm just happy with what the day brings at the moment. Colleen, I love you very much. Thank you for coming and talking to me today. There must have been somebody more interesting or important you could have talked to. Never.
anyone more important than you, and I love you too. Colleen Nolan is the big star in new books in your stores now, and she's on the TV at 12.30 most days with Lou Women. Thank you for talking to me. Thank you very much.